is this entire project just a way for me to procrastinate editing my Relax Regency videos? Yes, the, the answer is yes. Hello and welcome back to what is officially the silliest project I have ever made and this is coming from a woman who made herself an adult sized version of a 1930s owl costume that was originally designed for a six year old. Now if you have no idea what I'm talking about you should probably go and watch this video before carrying on here because it will make everything a lot clearer. But if you can't be bothered with that, which is fair enough, essentially to celebrate reaching five thousand subscribers on this channel I decided that I should try and remake the hilarious orange monstrosity that was my final textiles project from high school. As usual this quick and silly project turned into a lot more work than I had first anticipated so what was supposed to be one dumb video has turned into three dumb videos. This is the second in the trilogy where I'm going to remake this supposedly 1950s style blouse intended to be a costume from the musical West Side Story. Yeah, like I say, watch the other video and things will make a lot more sense. By some miracle, given that I've moved house about six times since I left high school, I still have the original sewing pattern that I used all those years ago. And so now I thought it would be interesting to see just how much I've improved as a maker after 11 years, two more sewing qualifications and about five years professional experience. I really hope I've improved otherwise this is going to be really damaging for my professional reputation. <laughs> anyway I left off that previous video contemplating which fabric from my stash I should use for this project and so here I am talking you through that decision. So I think I've made a decision about my fabric. I have got this white, I think it's a cotton, it might be a blend, sort of a lawn weight. It's got this woven stripe into it and I used this to make a Victorian blouse for a job ages ago. I overbought on the fabric just in case and so I've had this bit left which I've had plans to kind of turn into a mock Edwardian blouse but I actually think a sort of retro 50s 40s style blouse I'll get more wear out of. I've gone through my scrap fabric stash and I did contemplate using one of these um, like craft weight cottons that I've got random fat quarters of and things um, to do the contrasting collar and cuff but I've actually decided that I don't like that so what I think I'm going to do instead is I'm going to play with the direction of the stripe so the stripe is going to be vertical on the body then horizontal for the bands and the cuff and that will give enough visual interest so I think I'm going to put these away and just make it in the white but before I started cutting I needed to do a fitting to double check that this pattern was actually still going to fit me 11 years later. So it had been my intention to play about with the styling, you know, to change the sleeves and change the collar, but I actually really like the style of this more than I expected. The only things I'm going to change are the fit because it's too tight at the hips and strangely it's falling off the shoulder and the neckline fits relatively well. Yeah, the neckline fits relatively well, so it shouldn't be. So I need to take out some width there. Do you see and bring that up? And then it'll be a bit more uh, of a sort of statement shoulder, a bit more 40s, but yeah, I like it. I think it's cute. I might make the collar wider because I think that's the thing with the balance of a garment like this, with these big sleeves. I think this is too narrow. I think it needs to be wider. But I think that's all the alterations I'm going to do. I'm going to make it slightly narrower through the chest because it's still too big and I'm going to widen it through the hips because it's too small. Look, you can see it's gaping there. Pattern alterations decided on, I recut my pattern pieces and then began cutting them out. I had a very oddly shaped length of this fabric left which meant I had to get a bit creative with my cutting layout. But thankfully I had almost exactly enough fabric to make this work. So yesterday evening I cracked on with the pattern adjustments for this pattern because uh, I needed to let it out of the hip and it drops off the shoulder ever so slightly. It's on the mannequin here, that's what I'm pointing at. And so I took the shoulder in and I let the hip out a little bit. So I traced everything off onto dot and cross, pa dot and cross pattern paper and I made my adjustments and uh, you can see I've added about a centimetre on each part of the hips, that should give me four centimetres extra total, which should be enough. And um, I also then 
uh, shortened it. I think part of the reason why it was so tight at the hip was that I essentially just cut it. The, pa the pattern piece had uh, a flared shape at the hip, but I chopped all that off r rather than shorten it properly. Uh, so I shortened it properly this time around, so hopefully things will be fine. If it's a bit big on the hip, I'll just take it in. I also have cut my collar pieces. I, do you know, I was going to like re-twirl the collar and put it on the stand and see how I felt. And then I just decided to add a centimetre around the outside <laughs> and just make it fractionally bigger. So I think that will just help with the balance a little bit. And also if I'm taking the shoulder in, perhaps that will also help with the balance. So what I've done here, the collar and the cuffs, these are the cuffs. So these have the stripes you can just about see going um, around and on the collar as well it will be around the neck and the shirt itself has the stripes going this way so it will be vertical this way and then horizontal around the cuffs and horizontal around the neck and I think that will just provide a little bit of visual interest in the same way that the polka dot does uh, on the cuff here but I think it will just be a bit more sophisticated so everything's cut out now. I kind of got cracking with that because cutting's difficult for me and I don't really like to dwell on it and make it into a bigger thing than it needs to be by filming it. So um, I'm going to move on to the marking up now. And because that's something I definitely didn't mark this project up. I didn't think I even knew about the concept of marking up until I went to university. So I'm definitely gonna mark up these darts though. I reckon that's one of the reasons why these darts ended up not being very good. And then we shall start sewing. Ooh, it's exciting. It's coming together. It's coming together. I bought myself some of these friction pens which disappear with heat and I must confess I am absolutely converted from Taylor's chalk, particularly for white fabrics. The only downside is I keep forgetting and ironing away lines when I'm not supposed to, but they were ideal for these darts. I hadn't yet cut out my interfacing, so I then quickly did that. Unlike my high school project, I went for sew-in, woven interfacing. I just prefer it, as I find it's more comfortable to wear against the skin and washes better. It does, however, mean that it has to be tacked to the main fabric. I did this with long diagonal basting stitches. Then I stitched in the darts and completed the basic bodice construction, side seams, shoulder seams, etc. Of course, this time around, I was very careful to precisely run off the end of the dart and didn't reverse, tying off the loose threads for a sharper point. I pressed the darts using a tailor's ham, something I definitely didn't do at high school because we just didn't have them. I definitely remember going to university and wondering what that weird checked thing on the ironing board was, but the tailor's ham allows you to press fabric into a curved shape that imitates the way it will eventually lie on the body. I then made up all the other components of the blouse. I like to work like this now, starting by making up all the bits I'll need in advance of when I will actually need them. I feel it's quicker, but it also means I can batch similar tasks together, which as you will know from my sewing with a disability video, helps save energy. I then removed the tacking from the collar and graded the seam allowances for a lovely crisp edge. I also notched the curves to reduce bulk once they are turned through. Once I turned the collar right side out, I rolled the seam allowances between my fingers to get the seam line precisely on the edge of the collar before pressing it. So yesterday I got to the point of having made everything up, well almost everything, so I've got my collar made up, my sleeves made up and I've got the gathering stitches uh, sewn in ready to go for those. The body of the blouse is made up. So today I'm going to start by getting out my overlocker and overlocking all the raw edges as I did for the original that I made. And then I think I'm going to do the collar first because I prefer to do the collar before I put the sleeves in and get the facings on. I don't know if I'll get the sleeves in today. I might get the cuffs on the sleeves instead and then we'll leave setting in the sleeves for tomorrow. After that, it's just buttons and buttonholes. I need to decide what kind of buttons I'm having. It's amazing how quickly it's coming together, considering that this originally took me probably several months of, you know, a few hours every week to be able to work on it solidly. 
going to have a blouse in a couple of days, so that's nice. I'm sure part of that is I don't spend most of the time chatting to my friends, and part of it is I'm just better and more practiced than I was when I was 15. Let's crack on and see if we can't make a big dent in the construction of this blouse, because I've also got to make a skirt. I forgot to mention that today is the day that I actually woke up to 5,000 subscribers, and so if you don't believe me, look at that. I'm really excited. Uh, I know they say you shouldn't focus on the numbers and all of that, but um, yeah, I can't, I can't help it. It means a lot. It means a lot that maybe this wasn't such a terrible idea. <laughs> I chose to overlock the seam allowances together and then press them to one side as I had done on the original blouse. This is an industrial technique that we don't tend to use in the theatre as it makes things more difficult to alter. But as I highly doubt I will ever alter this blouse, I went with it. Something people always ask me about overlocking is what to do with the cut threads to stop them unravelling. I like to simply thread them back on themselves using a darning needle. It's neat. Easy to unpick if you do have to undo your overlocking, and much quicker than the alternative, which is zigzagging over them. Before attaching the collar, I stay stitched the neckline to stop the curve stretching out. So, as I have come to pin my collar on, I have realised something. You may remember that I added a centimetre all the way around the collar to make it bigger, and actually now I look at it, I can see that I thought about this, but I obviously didn't do anything about it um, because it now means that the collar is too long to fit into the neckline. So you see if we match this balance mark here, yeah, that there's supposed to be obviously one and, um, one and a half centimeter seam allowance there to attach the facing. And there's also then supposed to be a gap. If we look at the, uh, the lady who's modeling it, you can see that there's a, a notch, you know, there's a gap between the edge of the facing and the edge of the collar. So I need to make my collar a bit smaller. Not the end of the world, just means I'll have to flip it back the other way and machine a bit off the edge. So you can see here with my paper pattern, I obviously got halfway through this thought and then abandoned it because um, this is was the old cut line on the paper pattern and I did shave it off. I did round out this corner here on the pattern, but I obviously didn't cut it and I didn't cut it out like that. So I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, use that line as my new cutting line and see what happens. Okay, so I've restitched it now. I actually, you can see this was my first attempt, but this ended up with a weird point here, which really was not very pleasing. So I rounded it off just a little bit more, and now it looks much better when you turn it through. It's got a sort of really nice, um, even sort of gentle curve to it. So I'm going to trim this back up, press it again, grade the seam allowance, and then carry on with the collar. The pattern had this rather unusual technique for attaching the collar, which is something I've only ever seen in this kind of commercial paper pattern. The centre section of the collar that wasn't covered by the facing had the seam allowance snipped into and is pinned out of the way so that the rest of the collar and the facing can be machined on in one go. This is the sort of shortcut I hate, but I decided to do it as the instructions said, although I was very careful to tack everything in place first. I then realised I hadn't finished the edges of the facing, so I did this quickly using the technique I had used originally, just turning the wrong side up half a centimetre and edge stitching it in place. But then... My poor, beloved, reliable Benina jammed. I ended up having to disassemble a lot of the machine to get the facing out from under it, and then I gave it a good clean. So after that brief detour to do some machine maintenance, I was able to carry on stitching, but poor old Bernie the Benina was not sounding happy at all. I carried on with the construction of the facing, pressing under the seam allowance at the collar, as this would be hand stitched in place later. 
Before stitching the collar, I snipped the seam allowance of the body up to my stay stitching line so that I could ease the curved neckline into the straight collar a little easier. I then pinned the facing into position, sandwiching the collar between the blouse and the facing. The facing is stitched in place in one go, starting at the hem of the blouse. I then pivoted at the top, rounded off the point ever so slightly to get a sharper angle once the facing is turned through, then carried on sewing along the neck, catching the facing and the tacked on collar at the same time. I made sure to keep the top layer of the collar well out of the way as I stitched, as this layer would be turned under and hand stitched in place later. I stitched all the way around to the other side of the collar, pivoted again, rounded off the point of the facing, and then stitched down the front to the hem. Miraculously, everything had gone as planned, so I could begin removing the tacking. I graded the seam allowances at the neck and the facing to reduce bulk and to help the collar lay nicely. I also chopped off the excess at the corner to get that sharp point. Then, more pressing, again using the tailor's ham. One of the things that had really let the original blouse down was poor pressing, so this time around I was sure to press everything really well. I notched the seam allowance of the collar to help that straight edge curve around the neck, and then turned under the top layer of seam allowance to hide all the raw edges. I pressed and then pinned it in place. I also pinned those top edges of the facing that I had pressed under earlier to the seam allowance of the shoulder seam. These were then hand stitched in place with a herringbone stitch. I chose a herringbone stitch rather than the original slip stitch I had used as this allows for more movement which should reduce drag lines once the blouse is on the body. I did however slip stitch the collar seam allowance in place, although this time I used a double length of thread for strength. The next step was to make up the cuffs. These were just rectangles joined along one of the long edges. This seam was pressed open and then the short edges of the cuff were joined to form a loop. I was careful to make sure my seam allowances stayed flat as I stitched over them. This seam was then pressed open. The bottom of the sleeve was gathered down to fit the circumference of the cuff, then stitched in place with right sides together. I realised after sewing all the way around that I had still had my stitch length turned up from sewing the gathering stitches, so I had to sew around the cuff again. I then pressed the cuff in half precisely along the seam before turning the seam allowance under to hide all the raw edges on the wrong side. This was then sewn in place with the slip stitch. I then set the sleeves into the armhole. I matched up my balance marks and then pulled on my gathering threads to gather the sleeve head down to fit. I smooth and stroke the gathers to evenly distribute the volume before pinning and tacking them in place. I always sew my sleeves in two halves. I begin with the underarm section, sewing with the body of the garment facing up. These two curves should match exactly and you shouldn't be easing anything in. Then I turn the sleeve around and go back to where I started, only this time I sew with the sleeve itself facing up. This way I can better control the volume of the gathers and ease everything in smoothly. If you'd like to see a tutorial of how I do this in more detail, there'll be a card linking you to a video I made about that. I've gained some fake wisteria since you last saw me. Um, it's been a little while since I checked in and so I just thought I'd update you with where I am. So. Sleeves are on, cuffs are on. They are long, they come past the elbow and I'm not sure how I feel about that, but I tried the original one on and that's what they do, so we're going with it. In the future, however, if I to get more wear out of this, I think I will chop them ever so slightly because it's not a very flattering place where it hits. Flattering, I shouldn't use the word flattering, it's not a very pleasing place where it hits. The other thing is that typical bloody brain fog moment,
I, I measured the front length of the original blouse and I added the seam allowance for the neck edge, but I didn't add a hem allowance when I was cutting out, so the blouse is too short. So I've just overlocked around the edge and I'm literally going to have to just flip it up and top stitch it, which is fine, but uh, yeah, kind of annoying. You know, I should have measured twice and cut once, but I didn't because my brain doesn't work properly and I didn't think about it. So, you know, not the end of the world. So sleeves went in relatively well. I've got to get the overlocker out and overlock them, which is why I'm stopping for today because I don't have the strength for that. The overlock is heavy. And then buttons and buttonholes and the hem and it's done. So I've put it, put it on the stand with the original skirt. The, um, the other original blouse is under here, so that's why it's looking a bit bulky. The hips flare, I added quite a lot of hip flare, and it's quite dramatic, uh, but then it now sort of balances the ease of the rest of the garment. So, you know, it's not, it's not very slim fitting through the waist and the bust. It's kind of blousy all the way through, and now the hips match that, so I quite like that, so I think I'm gonna go with it. Anything else that I want to talk about with this? Fabric for the skirt is in the post, so that should be here soon, hopefully. It's snowing today, so I imagine that slowed things down. But apart from that, yeah, I'm calling it a day because I woke up at 4am again this morning, so um, yes, I'm very tired. The next day, I did get the overlocker out and overlocked those armhole raw edges. I also gave that seam a press over my tailor's ham so that the seam allowance went down into the sleeve. For the hem, I started by sewing the bottom of the facing to the blouse with right sides together. I then trimmed the corner and turned the facing right side out. This turned up the first section of the hem for me, which I then top stitched in place. I didn't pin or baste or even press it up, I just turned it up and eased it in as I went. The hem was so narrow and curved that it was actually easier to ease and sew it a little at a time as I got to it. I then used my new wool pressing mat to press the hem nice and flat. This thing really worked and made a noticeable difference, so 10 out of 10 would recommend. Well, okay, so the blouse is the blouse is 95% finished. The only thing left to do is the button and buttonholes on the centre front. And I must confess I'm a little nervous because my lovely Bonina machine has had a lot of has had a lot of use this year, much more than it usually gets, and it's starting to go a little bit on the blink. And as we all know, buttonholes are pretty uh, hard going on machines and I'm nervous about it. So uh, I'm, I'm torn between, obviously I'm gonna make a sample, always make a buttonhole sample, but I am genuinely worried that if I put my machine through this, I won't be able to use it. I can't get it serviced because we're in lockdown. I do have a backup machine somewhere in the loft, uh, but goodness knows what years in the loft have done to that. Uh, I've also got my antique wooden machine down here, but obviously that doesn't have a buttonhole feature. Part of me is really tempted to wait to do buttonholes until I can get this machine serviced, but because we're in a global pandemic, who the hell knows when that's going to be? So I don't really want to put Velcro on it like I did with this one because Velcro is just a really horrible material. It's really hard on clothes. It snags them and pulls them and doesn't wash well. Could I suppose do snaps instead? We could do a lot of, um, you know, poppers in theatre and for quick changes as well. But I would really like this to be a functioning wearable blouse. I think I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and try my, try the buttonholes on this banana. Okay, wish me luck. Oh, the other thing though about this blouse is that the pattern, on the pattern, the buttonholes go horizontally, uh, which is weird because I was always taught that uh, buttonholes on shirts should be vertical as opposed to horizontal. Um, should I do what the pattern says or should I use my judgment? I think because it's such a wide facing and it also looks like they recommend quite small buttons. That's 16 millimeter buttons. Yeah, that's pretty small. Don't know about what sort of buttons I've got. Oh, I need to figure this out. I'm leaving you. I've got I've got things to do.
In the end, I decided to go in the loft and find my old touring sewing machine from when I was well enough to actually go away on tour. The benefit of this machine is that it has an automatic buttonhole foot, which my Bernina doesn't, so I had a practice with that before measuring and marking up my centre fronts. I measured the original blouse to determine the position of the buttons, only to discover that they were, in fact, majorly wonky. I did decide to evenly space the buttons on my new version and marked out the position for the buttonholes. I decided to go for vertical buttonholes as they fit quite nicely between the woven stripes on the fabric. The automatic buttonhole foot uses this little lever to know when the buttonhole is big enough. If you've never used one before, here's a little clip of how it works. You have this weird plastic attachment where you put the actual button you are going to use and then the machine somehow knows how big to make the buttonhole and changes direction once the button touches the lever. That's a really bad explanation of how it works, so I've left in the full clip so you can just see for yourself. <laughs> As I used the friction pens to mark up the buttonholes, I gave them a press to remove the ink and then I added a little fray check before I cut them open. You might remember that I lost my buttonhole chisel when I made my 1950s dress. Well, I finally found it, so I could cut the buttonhole open with my chisel. I put some cardboard under the buttonhole as extra protection and then tried unsuccessfully to push the chisel through. In the end, I had to bash the end of the chisel with the only vaguely sturdy object I had to hand, my tailor's ham. Not its intended purpose, but it did the job. All that was left to do was to sew on the buttons. I matched the centre fronts up and pushed a pin through each buttonhole to determine where the corresponding button had to be sewn on. I stitched my buttons on over a pin so that they don't end up so tight to the fabric that the other side of the blouse can't sit flat underneath them. I then remove the pin and create a little thread shank by wrapping the thread around the button several times and pulling it tight. I then fasten off the thread on the wrong side, and with that, the blouse was finished. So, all in all, I think I'm going to call this project a success. It definitely turned out better than the original, so thank goodness for that. I don't have to tear up my degree certificate. It's, yeah, it's turned out weirdly trendy, which is not something I usually go for. I haven't really indulged in fast fashion trends for about 10 years because, you know, I've been trying to be a more ethical consumer and buy secondhand clothes and make my own clothes and all of that sort of thing. But it is kind I'm not going to lie, it is kind of nice to have something cool for once. And, you know, that's the wonderful thing about making your own clothes. I can still, you know, indulge in fashion, experiment with style and not contribute to environmental degradation or the exploitation of a largely female workforce. <laughs> and in terms of environmental impact, I used stash fabric for this. I used a pattern that I that's originally from 1999 and I've had for 10 years. So, you know, it's nice to look cool and not feel guilty for a change. I am really curious how how the sort of chapter three of this uh, series is going to go because um, circle skirts are pretty classic in shape they're pretty timeless so is the is the trendy nature of the blouse going to make the circle skirt also look really modern or is the sort of more timeless look of the circle skirt going to make the blouse look more vintage I don't know. We're going to have to wait and see. So if, if you'd like to watch a video where I make a circle skirt to replace this abomination, um, you should subscribe because there will be a video about that at some point in the future. But apart from that, all that's left to say really is thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Thank you.